from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org. At the legislature today, as the first full week of the session comes to a close, bills are slowly moving through the legislative process. We'll review the week with some of our colleagues who are also covering the issues. And we'll profile Senator Donna Boley of Pleasance County, a veteran lawmaker she's gone from being the only Republican in the Senate to now the only woman. These stories and more coming up on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. Senators voted on two bills today, but not without some debate between members. The first bill comes as a result of a $5 billion investment by Southwestern Energy to drill for gas in the Marcellus and Utica Shale regions of the state. Without the bill, senators say the company can't begin drilling and employing West Virginians. Senators voted to suspend the constitutional rule that a bill be read on three separate days so they could take immediate action on Senate Bill 280. Senate Judiciary Chair Charles Trump says the bill is simple. Uh, the bill, uh, as you have it before you, allows, simply allows the transfer uh, of a permit or permits with the written approval of the Secretary of DEP upon the approval, upon the Secretary's finding that the transferee uh, meets all the requirements for holding a well permit. As new oil and gas drilling companies make their way into the Marcellus and Utica Shale regions, many are being prevented from beginning work because of a rule enacted by the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. That rule prevents the transfer of well drilling permits between companies. Senate Bill 280 would trump the rule by allowing through code the transfer with DEP approval. Procedurally low, Senator John Unger says many of the members were not notified that they would have to vote on the bill so soon. As far as urgency of jobs, every bill that deals with job creation, one can argue is an urgent bill, but that still shouldn't in any way diminish the process to allow members the opportunity to read and study prior to coming. So it, it, it's for a fairness purpose, I think that as a deliberative body, um, we can expedite things but still allow the opportunity for people to read the bill and study before coming to the floor. Trump agreed with the need for the body to be deliberate, but stood by the decision to expedite the process, saying the issue is a pressing one. The uh, company that seeks to acquire these permits by transfer is precluded from doing work, from doing any work because of the current state of the rule, not the law, not that, you know, the law passed by this legislature is silent on the prohibition of transfers. Uh, but the agency apparently included in a rule a prohibition on the transfer. So notwithstanding the enormous investment that's been made in West Virginia, uh, it can't proceed, put people to work until we address this issue. Senator Doug Facemeyer, a Democrat from Braxton County, stood in support of the bill. We'll have plenty of issues to fuss across the aisle about, but we also need to recognize when there's something that's not a Democrat-Republican issue, it's the right thing to do for our state. It's the things that moves our state forward. I urge passage of this bill, and I'm proud to support it. And whenever we can work together, both bodies, not only is it the right thing to do, but it's our duty. Senate Bill 280 was approved 31 to 0. Senators next took up Senate Bill 12, a bill dealing with employee wages. Currently in state code, when an employee quits or is fired, his or her employer has four days to pay the employee's final wages. Senate Bill 12 would extend that time limit, however, from four days to the next regular pay period. Senator Mike Romano of Harrison County spoke against the bill. Two years ago, the requirement was that employees be paid within 72 hours, and he says in the age of technology we're in, he sees no reason why an employer can't pay a terminated employee quickly. This bill 
hurts hardworking people. It hurts people that may have a reason to be separated or terminated, which may not be their own doing, but they no longer have a job. It really helps no one. Uh, employers certainly have the ability to cut a paycheck so that people can use those funds to smooth over whatever tough times are ahead when they lose the job. I would recommend that this body see this bill for what it is, something that doesn't help businesses, certainly hurts working people, and vote against it. Thank you, Mr. President. Trump explained the committee's decision to alter the time the requirement. Much, many companies outsource payroll and having to uh, adopt a new abrupt schedule because of that circumstance is troublesome and difficult for companies. And, and to the committee, the uh, belief was that what makes the most sense is just keep it on the same schedule it's always been on. The bill was approved by a vote of 24 to 7. All seven nays came from Democrats. A controversial bill that gives employers some immunity from lawsuits over workplace accidents is off the agenda for the House Judiciary Committee, at least for now. Committee Chairman John Schott announced today that stakeholders are meeting, are meeting to come to an agreement on the bill's provisions. House Bill 2011 deals with the issue of deliberate intent lawsuits. It was the subject of a public hearing earlier this week. After yesterday's tense debate over coal, alternative fuels and renewable resources, another bill relating to energy was the center of attention on the House floor today. A Republican delegate's amendment caused some concern from Democrats. Liz McCormick reports. In the House chamber, House Bill 2201 was up for its third reading, but with pending amendments for the chamber to consider. The bill requires the Public Service Commission to adopt certain net metering and interconnection rules and standards. Net metering is a practice already used in the state. Individuals who own their own personal source of electricity, things like solar panels or wind turbines, send the extra electricity they generate back to the grid for sale to other customers. Their electric company would in turn give the client a credit to use later, saving them on future electric costs. The first amendment to the bill was proposed by Delegate Woody Ireland, chair of the House Energy Committee. He suggested two provisions be added, one to include some new safety provisions for linemen and the other allowing nonprofits to receive energy credits from companies who own and operate renewable energy equipment on their property. Ireland's amendments passed unanimously, but the same could not be said for an amendment proposed by Delegate Michael Folk of Berkeley County. Mr. Speaker, this simply adds language that states the commission shall assure that any net metering tariff does not create a cross subsidization between customers within one class. What Folk means is if a utility company must upgrade their system to comply with net metering standards, the costs for those upgrades cannot be passed on to rate paying customers who do not participate in the net metering program. For instance, 99, over 99 percent of our customers are not net metering customers. Those people, by very definition of the what, and practice of what is done today, are subsidizing the net metering customers. This brought some concern from Delegate Stephen Skinner, who questioned why an amendment like this was never discussed in committee. We're bringing the committee work to this chamber and we've had no testimony about it, and we don't know what the consequences are. We can't predict those consequences. One of the things that um, my good friend, the chair of the judiciary, uh, has, has said constantly over the last few years is we need to look out for unintended consequences. And we don't even have the information right now to understand what this means. We're adding a new term to code that hasn't been defined. We're letting government get further involved in the actions of the PSC. It doesn't make sense for us to amend this at this time when we don't know what it means. We don't know whether it's going to impact those 1,600 solar panels and the, and the big customer in Charlestown. We don't know whether uh, Reads Martin Distributing in Martinsburg, who has invested heavily in solar panels. We don't know whether this is going to impact them. Let's hear from them. Maybe it's not a bad idea. But why would we rush on the floor and avoid the committee process when considering this? 
Other Democrats backed Skinner's proposal, but in the end, the amendment won the vote. John Schott is the House Judiciary Chair. And although I generally uh, agree with the policy of the committee doing all the legwork, um, in this particular case, this, this amendment does not uh, make an extreme change to the, to the, the purpose of the bill. Uh, it basically is an expression of our policy that uh, as this, we assume net metering will grow across the state. And it's basically a policy of, of, of this body that the, that growth not be on the backs of non-net metering uh, customers, that the, the customer that benefits from the net metering basically pays the price of the net metering. And we're not telling the commission how to do that. We're simply saying, you as the experts, uh, you make sure that this doesn't happen. Now, if this is already in code, uh, and I'm not going to challenge that. It does no harm. To, it may be redundant. It may please the book publishers to add another line of uh, text to their books, but it would do no harm. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a useful uh, expression of our policy that although we want to encourage the use of net metering, we don't think we ought to, other customers who don't benefit from that should have to subsidize that cost. Delegate Folk's amendment passed 63 to 33. The bill itself, House Bill 2201, passed. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. Also today, House Bill 2025 passed unanimously. The bill prohibits sex offenders from loitering within 1,000 feet of a school, child care facility, or a victim's home. In the first 10 days of this legislative session, we've already seen some heavy debate in both chambers over rules and some legislation, and even the passage of a few bills in both the House and the Senate. Here to recap all of the week's events for us, two members of the Capitol Press Corps. Mandy Cardosi is the State House reporter for the State Journal, and Jonathan Matais also covers the State House for the Associated Press. Guys, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks, Thanks for, having, for us. having us. So two big issues this week, the repeal of the energy portfolio and the governor's budget announcement. Let's start with that energy bill. First, it was introduced in both chambers and right away the newly elevated energy committees took it up. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in those committees. Mandy, what happened? Yeah, so after the committees discussed it, um, both of them, both bodies had passed the bill and now we're just waiting to hear um, how they're going to merge them together and how they're going to send it to the governor. So the way that they've done it so far is to amend to keep the net metering, which means that the people who already have agreements with utility companies, the people who are generating private electricity, they can continue to get rebates from those utility companies. And we saw the Senate this morning, instead of taking the House bill and running it through the committee process again, they decided to go ahead and put it on first reading. So likely Monday we'll see a strike and insert, I'm assuming, with their language and, and they'll move that bill forward. But it wasn't necessarily an easy floor on the cell, the, an easy cell on the floor. Earlier this week there was some uh, conflict between the minority leaders and both leaders of the chamber. Jonathan, you want to tell us about that? Sure. The Republican leaders in both chambers have uh, decided to come up with what they call economic impact or job statements for bills, but those only would come into play if the House Speaker or the Senate President uh, requested them. So um, the Democratic leadership said, this seems like a great opportunity, let's test this out. Um, this has also been an issue that was just pounded against the Democrats on the campaign trail. Um, and it's also an issue that's being pounded against Senator Joe Manchin, uh, the Democratic uh, senator who potentially could run for governor. So there's some politics involved there too. But Democrats said um, a lot of folks are testifying that this is not really going to have an impact on rate payers. It's not going to have an impact on the power companies. The coal, c the coal companies actually helped write some of this law and now are sort of backtracking on it. But uh, the Republican leadership turned that, uh, that offer down. So early next week, we'll see a final version of the bill, I'm sure. Also this week, we had announcement from, an announcement from the governor that he found $44 million, which is not exactly what happened. But do you want to explain what that press conference was earlier this week? Well, sure. Um, this year, um, for the upcoming budget, the governor uh, thought he would have to take about $69 million out of the rainy day fund, which is just a, basically a last reserve kind of uh, reserve fund. 
Um, but they said uh, this week that they, they essentially got some better investment returns than they thought out of their uh, public retirement uh, accounts. Mainly it was the teacher retirement account. So they were able to uh, say, we have this $44 million that we're, we're banking on that's going to be there. We're going to be able to take out some of this money that we thought we would have to basically extract out of reserves. So I think it's down to about $25 million now, which w was applauded by the Republicans also, but they don't want to take any rainy day money at, at all. So Right. They still don't want to use this $25 million. So Mandy, are they talking about where they think they'll find that money? Yeah, I think that they have, I know the Senate has said the House is taking the lead and they're going to try and find it in state agencies. Um, they want to start auditing some of the state agencies like DHHR. I know they've already started with DOH and they're trying to see how they can reallocate some money and see how the agencies can run a little bit more efficiently so that they can um, just save money and cuts in those kind of places. So not necessarily cutting jobs or cutting anything out of the agencies, but just seeing how they can operate at a little bit more efficient way. After two years of budget cuts and hiring freezes, it's kind of hard to believe that there's any waste left. But I guess if they're on a mission, Hopefully they'll find it. Jonathan Matais with the Associated Press, Mandy Cardosi with the State Journal. Thanks both for thank you both for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having us. In a moment, a profile of the only female member of the West Virginia Senate. But first, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 286 to provide medical and religious exemptions from mandatory immunizations for school children. Senate Bill 288 at the request of the governor to revise certain aspects of public school finance and the school aid funding formula. Senate Bill 289 to prohibit state-regulated health insurance plans and policies that cover various anti-cancer treatments from requiring higher co-payments, deductibles, or co-insurance for anti-cancer treatments that are administered orally rather than intravenously. Senate Bill 295 to establish an appeal process for decisions issued by the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources Board of Review and the Bureau for Medical Services. Senate Bill 296 to provide that the maximum licensed school psychologist pupil ratio is 1,500 pupils for each licensed school psychologist. Up for passage in the Senate on Monday, Senate Bill 43 to limit the tolling of the statute of limitations with regard to third-party complaints within a civil action to be filed within a reasonable time. On second reading, the amendment stage, Senate Bill 13 relating to personal injury cases. The bill permanently reinstates the open and obvious doctrine for premises liability law, which has been the law of West Virginia for more than 100 years, and overrule the decision of the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia in the case of Hirsch v. E.T. Enterprises issued in November 2013, and House Bill 2001 to repeal portions of the Alternative and Renewable Energy Portfolio Act. West Virginia's longest-serving member of the state Senate has seen plenty of change in her career, from being the sole member of her party to being the chamber's only female member. Senator Donna Boley has dealt with the challenges that come with each. And now she says she's prepared to take on a new challenge, being in the majority. There was a time when Boley was one of seven women in the state Senate, but for the past three years, she's been its only female member. The senator says gender hasn't been a dividing factor for her. The guys treat her like one of the guys, she says jokingly. In the early 1990s, Boley was the only Republican member of the upper chamber, making her minority leader. State law allows a Republican to sit on every Senate committee, but in her first year as the sole Republican in 1991, Boley appointed herself only to six of the 17. Still, she says, that wasn't an easy undertaking. It was difficult attending all the committee meetings, but I had some staff, I think I had about four or five staff members, and they would cover the other committees for me, and then we'd get back at the end of the day and say, this is what's happening. And in some respect, I knew more about what was going on in the various committees than I might know today. Um, but uh, it was tough. 
Over the years, though, the makeup has changed, and now, for the first time in her career, Bowley is a member of the majority party. It comes with its perks, like leading committees and setting the agenda, but those perks come with challenges. You've got to remember that there's not one Republican here that's ever chaired a committee. And we we're going to have to learn that. We're going to have to learn how to govern. With three decades of experience, new senators will likely look to Bowley for guidance, but she says she'll need their help too. I might bring some experience from here, but a lot of the new senators and the current senators, you know, they come from business backgrounds. You know, they're, a lot of them are professionals, and they'll bring a lot of that organization skill to the legislature. The senator has spent her entire career as a member of the Education Committee, an area of policy in which she's passionate and often outspoken. Our education system is failing our students here in West Virginia. Bowley's concern for several years now has been Common Core, the national standards West Virginia has adopted that are changing the way students learn. The senator is not a fan of the next generation standards, as they're called by the West Virginia Department of Education, but she says maybe she's wrong. The problem, she says, is there hasn't been enough discussion. Let's just open it up to transparency, and I would love if our education committee could uh, start touring, maybe do five or six hearings across the state. Let the parents come out, the students come out, the teachers come out, and even board members, state board members who support it. Let them come out and explain their position. But so far, we have been stalled. We have not had any meetings on it or anything. As the new vice chair of education, she certainly has the influence to make those statewide meetings a reality. Bowley says she's hopeful her party can accomplish a lot this session and that the new Democratic minority will be open to the issues they present. I know it's a shock to them what happened, shock to all of us, but they're, you know, they're legislators, they want what, what's best for West Virginia. Uh, we're going to differ on issues, you know, as we've done in the past, but I'm hoping that they'll give the Republican issues a chance, both in the House and the Senate. So far, the Senate has approved three pieces of legislation presented by the Republican majority. All three have been approved, but only two in a nonpartisan manner. And here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 2240, to provide that an act of domestic violence or sexual offense by strangling is an aggravated felony offense. House Bill 2259, to require the governor to make appointments within 60 days of the date of vacancy occurs on a professional board. The bill also provides that a person appointed to serve on a board is limited to eight years of service. House Bill 2260, to prohibit the Department of Health and Human Resources from expanding enrollment in Medicaid without authorization from the legislature. House Bill 2262, to allow counties and cities to levy an up to 3% sales tax on food and beverages sold in restaurants. House Bill 2269, to require rules of the Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Health and Human Resources, Division of Natural Resources, and the Department of Commerce be no more stringent than corresponding federal law or regulations. House Bill 2270 prohibits employment decisions concerning higher education faculty members from being based solely on political or religious beliefs. The bill also prohibits students from being graded on political or religious beliefs. House Bill 2271, to give the State Board of Education no more than five years to improve any school or school system under its control. The bill requires the State Board to provide a public hearing if it seeks to take control of the school system again. And House Bill 2275, to increase the fines and community service hours for littering. On second reading in the House on Monday, House Bill 2002, to establish the comparative fault standard and abolish joint liability and implement several liability. Fault is expressed as a percentage, and in any action seeking damages for personal injury, property damage, or wrongful death, recovery shall be predicated upon principles of comparative fault, and the liability of each person who caused the damages shall be allocated to each person in direct proportion to that person's percentage of fault.
This has been the legislature today. On Monday, we'll begin meeting all of the new committee chairs of the 82nd West Virginia Legislature. First up will be House and Senate Judiciary Chairs, Senator Charles Trump of Morgan County and Delegate John Schott of Mercer County. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org.